Welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. This is a space we've created to explore the components of diversity, inclusion, and cultural competency. Cultural competency. And all of the ways in which these components present themselves in our professional and personal lives. Be it language, culture, socioeconomic class, gender, race, ability level, age, or so many other identifiers. Everything begins with a conversation. conversation. Join us in this space where we seek to empower, educate, and uplift by creating authentic conversations on issues that affect us every day in every way. We look forward to you joining us in our discussions with everyone from thought leaders, diversity and inclusion strategists, students to CEOs in the corporate, education, and nonprofit sectors. Let's discuss how we can better understand differences and leverage commonality. Let's do away with political correctness, explore ideation, build community, and create allies. Let's start an authentic conversation. This is the Global Fluency Podcast, and this is Bertine Crevacore West. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Global Fluency Podcast. My name is Bertine Crevacore West, and I'm your host. I'd love to introduce you all to our special guest today, Ms. Jacqueline Twilley. Jacqueline, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Bertine. And so, Jacqueline, I'm going to tell our listeners a little bit about you, and then we're going to dive on into the conversation. So, Jacqueline. Sounds Twilley- good. Thank you. Jacqueline Tully holds an MBA in leadership. She is the founder and president of ZeroGap.co. It's a global training and development firm that specializes in women's leadership within male-dominated industries. ZeroGap has been identified as one of the fastest growing companies in 2019 by Inc. Magazine. Jacqueline is a best-selling author on Amazon. Her upcoming book, Don't Leave Money on the Table, is set to be released on August 22, 2019. She's also been featured in Forbes, Fastco, Essence, Now, Black Enterprise, Parade, Today.com, NBC, BLK, and more on the topic of women's leadership and negotiation strategy. Jacqueline is a graduate of Southeastern Louisiana University and earned her MBA from Tiffin University. Her life's mission is to eliminate the gender wage gap by providing a practical strategy for women to advance and thrive in leadership roles. In her downtime, she loves to practice yoga and cook. When Jacqueline isn't working on leadership development for women, she enjoys seeing the world from up in the air check out her skydive video on YouTube as well. So Jacqueline, once again, on behalf of Global Fluency Podcast, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. So we're delighted to have you. And one of the things that um, I want to focus on with regard to diversity is um, really just wage discrimination and what that means um, insofar as women having an inclusive professional and well women being in an inclusive professional environment so um as i said to you when we were off air i enjoy following you on linkedin and i thought you'd be an amazing guest for our show so i'm delighted that you could join us today i'm happy to dig into the conversation all right so let's get started so my first question for you jacqueline is what inspired you to become involved in this type of work so I've shared this on LinkedIn before, um, but I'm just going to repeat it for the podcast. I was on a spiritual journey for about three years trying to understand what my purpose was. So if you look at my corporate background, it's like many entrepreneurs. It's not a one plus one equals two. I started out in advertising and publishing, and I, my last traditional job was in global health, working for the Center for Disease Control. And so through that journey of just being a high performer, you know, being identified as one of the the best within my organization, I was still not um, feeling like I was doing all of the work that I could be doing. I was definitely doing meaningful work, especially working at the Center for Disease Control. So throughout this journey and following the curiosity, I landed on this work. And in so many ways, I say I didn't find it, it found me. And so that's why I'm on a mission to eliminate the gender wage gap. And I primarily do that in two ways. So one, I teach women how to negotiate so that they don't leave money on the table. And then the other way is through Zero Gap, my company, how we focus on 
women in male dominated industries and helping them to get into leadership roles and stay there. Because in 2019, you know, we have less than 5% of CEOs who are women. And that's just, Every time I look at the stat, even though I'm very familiar with it, it just doesn't sit right with me. And so I'm a person who solves big problems. I believe the impossible is possible. So that's the long answer to why I do this work. Well, I love that you said that you're a person that solves big problems, um, because I think a lot of times um, we don't give ourselves enough credit for tackling the difficult issues. And so I particularly am, am a fan of seeing that, um, especially with women in professional industries. I think it's very important um, that, that we have leaders such as yourselves. It's important for young girls in particular um, to see people such as yourself out there um, being the model that they can follow. Well, I, and I appreciate it. And you know, I've always had strong um, role models in my life, women of different races, as well as men. And so when we look at how we roadmap our careers, a lot of it is modeled off of the inspiration that we see other people doing. And so I have to give full credit to everyone who mentored me or coached me along this journey. So then let's jump in, Jacqueline, to the next question. What is wage discrimination? What does that really mean? So it means exactly, exactly what uh, it's called. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so what I focus on is the gender wage gap. And in that, what we see is that women across all industries are paid less than men for similar work. So at first glance, a lot of people will think, oh, the wage gap only applies to what we call blue collar workers. And that's not true. It stretches from everything from people who are in housekeeping all the way up to lawyers and doctors. And so what we see on the level where we have a housekeeper, a housekeeper and a janitor do very similar types of work. But janitors are typically men and they get paid more than housekeepers, although the, the scope of the work is very similar. And then when we get to the legal profession and the medical profession, we see this wage gap persist. So then there are so many different nuances that cause the wage gap. We look at everything from access to childcare, paid family leave, traditional societal norms that women are caretakers, not just for young kids, but also for elderly family members. And then um, when a woman gives birth, she, you know, she goes out of work for some time. And so we look at our laws. And in addition to the laws, we look at how work in the U.S. has been traditionally set up where it was illegal for women to work for so many years in our country's history. So all of those factors contribute to the wage gap. And then as we drill down and we're looking at some of the historical framework of how work was set up in this country, women of color weren't allowed to do certain types of work. And so when we drill down even deeper into the wage gap, data, we see that women of color are paid significantly less than their counterparts across the board. And that is a result of these decade-long laws that were in place. And now, even though we have equal pay laws on the book in some, some areas, it's still not being effective in moving the needle. So those are just some of the ways that we, the causes of the wage gap and there are many more and some of it is undescribed and some of it is flat out discrimination still. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well I, I have to say um, I learned something brand new with regard to um, what you said about janitors and housekeepers. I have to tell you I've never even thought about that and their work is very similar and I never even considered that there would be um, a, a gender gap a gender pay gap between those two. Um, that is something that I don't think most of us think of on a daily basis. And, and I like that you mentioned that because that shows me that that affects every level of professional work that people do. Because normally I hear talk about this um, with regard to CEOs and executives, but um, from every angle there, this pay gap exists. Yep, and it's such a pervasive problem, and that's why when we talk about it, it's important for us to have the robust conversation around the issue, because there are so many nuances in it, and even when we look at gig work, which is trending up, even female Uber drivers 
earn less than male Uber drivers. And you think, how can this be? Because the system is not biased. But what happens is there is some research that came out, and I believe it was late 2017 or early 2018. And what it did was it analyzed several hundred drivers. And so because men tend to drive above the speed limit, on average, they're completing more jobs per hour, which leads them to earn more money. Now, this report was done before Uber allowed for tipping. So I don't know if it's leveled out any because of the tipping aspect. But so when you look at even our going back to societal norms, what we see is acceptable going a little bit over the speed limit and women staying within the rules and driving the speed limit, it is to their disadvantage where they earn less money because they're not completing as many jobs per hour. So this, this issue is so robust that we have to continue to talk about it in the fullness of the problem in order to really enact change and then to close the wage gap. Well, you weren't kidding when you said that this is pervasive. Again, um, another pro of information that, that I had never even considered before with regard to you know driving according to the speed limit. Um, honestly, who would think that that would relate to how much a woman would make as an Uber driver? Because on the face of it, it seems that both people are doing the exact same thing, but in actuality, they're not. And, and I would never have thought of speed limit for that. And I'm so grateful that, again, we have speakers like you to bring these, these issues to the light and, and that research is being done on this um, to show the various, um, various other factors that affect how we, we as women get paid in, in comparison to men. Yes. Now we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor. Westbridge Solutions is a professional training company focusing on diversity, inclusion, cultural competence, and soft skills trainings. Westbridge Solutions offers a variety of innovative training courses, both in-person and online, live and self-paced. Their clients include corporations, government organizations, healthcare organizations, the nonprofit sector, universities, and individuals such as yourself. Through their rigorous training programs, Trainees learn to understand differences, leverage commonalities, and achieve organizational, professional, and personal actualization. To learn more about Westbridge Solutions, please feel free to visit their website at www.westgrouptraining.com or follow them on social media on Facebook and Instagram. Westbridge Solutions, empowering professionals for success. So then my next question, and I think we, we started to touch upon this when you were saying, um, when you were in your previous response about child care and family leave and, and our, our laws prohibiting women from working and then going further to um, prohibiting women of color from receiving paid work once we were legally able to work. What other root causes um, do you think are responsible for, for large pay gaps? So I covered quite a bit, and the list goes on and on, but on a high level, uh, we touched upon many of those issues that contribute to the wage gap, and I cannot um, emphasize this even more is to understand how robust this is. So within each organization, oftentimes it's not just one thing that causes the wage gap, and a lot of times it's systematic. It's companies have systems in place for a reason, but over time, you forget why you put a system in place. And so what happens is we continue in traditional companies to operate the same way. And then over time, you're not sure why you're doing this. And because you're not sure and you're not looking at the impact on the workforce, you're perpetuating these stereotypes that widen the gap in terms of employees. So just last week, I was at the engineering and construction conference for women in Chicago, and it was a, a very beautiful moment. I learned that the year prior when I gave the presentation on women in negotiation, that one of the gentlemen who was a senior level VP at his firm went back to his company. He conducted a pay audit. 
90% of the women within their organization were not being paid at parity compared to the men. And so he was able to bring them up to parity, and he also funded a women's ERG group that's open to everybody, but to specifically talk about the issues of women within a male-dominated industry to educate the full workforce. So when we look at the nuances of all of these different causes to the wage gap, we have to be aware of the internal systematic issues of how the companies are set up and really going back and questioning, why do we do this? Why do we pay people with certain things? And so I know we're going to get into some differences of small companies and large companies in just a second. So I'll just pause there. Okay. All right. Thank you. So then um, my next question is, being that we have currently, I want to say about four to five different groups of people in the workforce with regards to, with regards to age. So we'd have the traditionalist, um, which would be perhaps the example of that would be a greeter at Walmart. Um, we'd have the, the baby boomers. We have the Gen Xers. We have the millennials. And we have the Gen Zs that are probably just entering into the workforce. Would you say that this gender um, pay gap increases with age at all? So there's a two part there. In terms of like generational data, I don't, I'm not familiar with generational pay data, but what I do know is that when you see a person entering the workforce right around college age, uh, they tend to start off closer in pay, but not necessarily equal. And so what research shows is that, and this is um, Linda Babcock and Sarah Lassiter from their book, Women Don't Ask, when a woman doesn't negotiate her first job offer, as compared to her male counterpart, she stands to lose over a half a million dollars over the course of her career. And so what we see is that these systematic rules that are put in place internally when a, a woman takes maternity leave, her performance isn't measured the same. And some people call this a motherhood penalty. And so what you'll see is that women over time in the workforce if they are become mothers at some point, the wage gap widens more than women who do not have kids. And so that's just another nuance into, we talked about the causes of how mag magnified this issue gets over the course of time. And so because more men are starting to take paternity leave, there isn't a lot of data on the impact of men taking time off for the birth of children and such. So I'm interested to see where that goes, but the research does prove to your point of, yes, it does widen over time. Well, and, and I, I love that you mentioned a men taking paternity, paternity leave um, because kind of a peripheral question in my mind was, um, what about um, when we have um, same-sex couples and there, there are two dads? And so how does that affect you know, the, the pay gap are, will men, will men be subject at some point um, to this sort of fatherhood penalty, I'm wondering. Um, but I guess, you know, the information on that will, will come about as, as we just go further on um, evolving into um, a more diverse society. And so where we establish um, some sort of, I want to say some sort of, I'm trying to think of the word here, some sort of just when, when we have more data, I, I should say, um, I'm interested to see how that will play a role um, when we're talking about um, same-sex couples for, for men or women. So if you have two moms or two dads, I wonder if that gender pay gap will be affected in any way, um, adversely or positively. Um, I'm curious as to how that would turn out. Yeah, and so with that, going back to, to the core um, set of facts that we started with, with the wage gap, because we know that men across industries get paid more, I don't think it's going to be a fatherhood penalty. If anything, in my view, it will level out. Mm -hmm. And what's going to happen is it won't be a penalty because we still look at the leadership of companies. And as I said earlier, less than 5% of Fortune 500 CEOs are women. So you, our country's workforce leadership wise still largely dominated by men so i don't think it will have as a negative impact i think more likely than not what it would do is raise our level of consciousness 
to the type of systems that we put in place that adversely affect women. And so what it, what it in my hope, will do is level out the playing field. Okay, okay. That is the hope. That is the hope. So then Jacqueline, is there a difference in the gender pay gap between small companies and large companies? That's hard to say because companies do not have to share their data. Mm. So without those facts, we cannot definitively say. And then with that, earlier this year, there was this article that got a lot of publicity about an um, Obama era law that would increase pay transparency that the uh, that the Trump administration decided was undue um, what do they call it an undue burden on companies to disclose their wage data and so that's being challenged in law I'm sure this is a going to be a very long battle but until we have some type of system to actually look at the facts we can't say for sure okay okay that makes sense. That makes sense. So then companies are under no legal, ethical obligations to, to present their data, even um, if it may help, um, even if it may help them pay their employees a, a fair and equal wage, but also um, help engage their employees in, in the company's mission um, and vision. So they are under no obligation to do any such thing. Well, so there's a difference between legal and ethical, mm -hmm. and, and that can be a whole different podcast. Yes. <laughs> so, so, again, there are no laws that say that they have to disclose this. Now, it is illegal to discriminate based on pay. So if we look at the Lilly Ledbetter Act, which was the, the first piece of legislation signed under our previous president, what that Lilly Ledbetter their uh, pay act was supposed to do was to make it where women would get paid the same as men. So in the case of Lily Ledbetter, what happened was she was a plant manager for the Goodyear Tire Company right outside of Birmingham, Alabama. And one day she found out that she was being paid less than her male counterparts. They were all supervisors. Someone slipped her a piece of paper. And so she ultimately sued and it went up to the Supreme Court. And what was decided is that because Lily did not challenge her wages of not being paid fairly compared to the male supervisors at the time that it happened, not at the time that she found out, but the time that the pay discrimination first happened, that she was not eligible to receive any compensation for being paid unfairly. So again, like I said earlier, one of the causes is that our laws have not caught up to uh, making it an, an inclusive workforce. So when we look at things like that, that is a direct signal of companies who should ethically do the right thing, but legally they're not bound to, to do certain things. And that's why uh, when we look at, we have so many women who are becoming elected officials throughout every stage, local, um, state, and federal, why that's so important, because when we have a full scope of people at the table, at, as, you know, this is a diversity podcast, so we know when you have people who are looking at issues from every angle, you're better able to make decisions, and so that's why it's really important for us to pay attention to making sure that we're um, electing the very best people, but also people from diverse backgrounds, so that they can look at these challenges from every angle. Wow, that's I really love that answer. And I do think um, in order for us to have allies, um, you know, with regard to decreasing that gender pay gap, um, we would have to have people um, from diverse backgrounds. Um, so because this is an issue that affects women, um, we would still need men to be allies. Would you agree? Of course. This, and this isn't a women's issue. This is, this is a societal issue. Sure. Sure. We know that when a, when a woman earns money she reinvests that money into her community at a higher rate than what men do and so the community just isn't you know female only this is the entire community and i don't have the exact stat on the top of my head but you all can google this and see the gdp impact if we were to bring women up to parity across the country as well as the world it would have a significant impact on our gdp so even from that perspective of you know having those allies, it's not even about 
uh, men and women, which is why going back to the example I shared with a company who started the ERG to talk about women's issues that's open for everybody, we have to have more programs that look like that specifically because it's going to solve so many problems in terms of society problems. Mm, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. So then with, with regard to um, Ms. Ledbetter and, and the ruling on her case, being that I'm going to go out on a limb and say that she didn't know to, um, to contest um, the, the amount that she was being paid in comparison to her male counterparts, um, when she found out, maybe there was not some avenue or a systemic um, sort of gateway pathway put in place for her to do so. Um, people simply, women in particular, would not know to do this. And if they, they did feel that they should do this, could they? Um, are these systems actually put in place? So um, that leads me to ask you, what can women do to empower themselves and combat wage discrimination? So at the core, women already have power. Mm -hmm. And so when you have a seat at the table, when you are in a position, you already have that power. So part of it is just recognizing that. In the case of Lily, she couldn't contest it because she didn't know. And if you look at how American companies have been set up, a lot of companies tell their employees that they can't talk about pay. And there's some type of retaliation associated with that in terms of you'll be written up or you might be terminated, et cetera. So the system that was perpetuated, especially during the time where Lily was working, really didn't allow for that conversation to be robust. So there was no way that she could have challenged it, even if there was a system in process for her to report it. How can you report something that you have no knowledge of? And so in terms of moving forward, how do you ensure that you're being paid fairly? One of the things that is so great is that there's so much salary data available to us these days via online tools. So I always tell people, don't stop at the online tools that you can find. Be engaged in professional associations. And with that, have those candid conversations. So what happens, and this is what I teach women when I do the negotiation workshops, you want to do your market research up front. What does the market pay for someone in this position in my geographic area? And then you check that online, but then you fact check that with people in your network, specifically people who are look different than you. So for me as a black woman, I would talk to someone who is a white male, someone who looks different than me. And I know the research shows that white men get paid more in traditional work environments, but you can't roll up to somebody and say, hey, John, how much you make? That's just not going to work. So what I tell people <laughs> to do is <laughs> very awkward. So what I tell people to do is go to somebody that you genuinely respect and trust and say, hey, you know what, I'm doing a little research possibly considering making a change in my career based on the research I found someone with my experience and in this area would earn $110,000. Does that sound about right? And so at that point, when you pause and allow that person to answer, they'll say, oh yeah, that sounds about right, or that's a little high, or that's a little low, and the conversation will evolve from there. That's an easier way to have that conversation, but information is power in business. The more you know, the better informed decisions you can make. So um, in my bio, you reference the book that's coming out later this year, Don't Leave Money on the Table. And the core of that book is a five-part negotiation framework, and it's called Latte, partly because I love coffee and lattes, but also because that five-part strategy, it stands for, that's, Latte is an acronym. L, look at the details. A, anticipate challenges. T, think about the walkaway point. The second T, talk it through. And then E, evaluate options. So in terms of claiming the power that you already have, information is your best source of making well-informed decisions. That's excellent. And well, I guess that went naturally into um, my last question for you. What are two things you'd like to impart upon our listeners? But it sounds like you answered that already. I love the acronym. Um, I think that's very relevant. And as a fan and strong supporter of Latte, I would definitely remember that. And I'm sure most of our listeners would as well. Um, so Jacqueline, 
tell me and our listeners, where can we find out more about you? Um, where can people contact you if they'd like to um, benefit from your training and development initiatives, if they want to learn more about um, the latte program that you have in play, tell us where we can find you. So the company's website is zerogap.co. So Z-E-R-O-G-A-P.co. And on there, you can find all of the information about the resources that we provide. And personally, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. It is my favorite place to hang out online. So Jacqueline V. Twilly, and just drop in a note that you heard me on this podcast, and I definitely will connect with you there. All right, listeners, so this is where you can find Jacqueline Twilly. Look for her on LinkedIn, and I hope that... um, well, for me, for sure, this has been really valuable information. So I'm certain for our listeners that it has been as well. And I hope that they take this information that you graciously shared with us, Jacqueline, and they help continue the conversation. Uh, the goal of Global Fluency Podcast is to start those conversations, realizing that uh, some of them don't have to be that difficult. But for the ones that are that difficult, um, I thank you for providing our listeners with a framework so they can get that conversation going and really um, expand everything we, we thought we knew about diversity and inclusion and really uh, be allies to, to people that are different from ourselves. So Jacqueline, on behalf of Global Fluency Podcast, thank you so much for being on the show and for sharing all of this wonderful knowledge. For our listeners out there, please continue the conversation. Thank you again for having me. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. Tune in every second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. for our latest episode. Connect with us on our social media. You can find us on Facebook at Global Fluency Podcast and on Instagram at Westbridge Solutions, LLC. Global Fluency Podcast. Understanding differences. Leveraging commonalities. Let's keep the conversation going. Going.